Professor, congratulations. It Thank is you. remarkable that um, your very incredible, complex and ambitious project uh, is now in uh, the winner's uh, seat. Um, it, I'm deeply impressed. When was the first moment that you thought perhaps we could make it and get that prize, that <laughs> award? Well, for us, it was, uh, it was uncertain pretty much all the way through because we're fully aware that this is a, it's a very big challenge. It's very ambitious. It is high risk, um, but we are so passionate that this must happen and it must happen now. And the technology is there to help us make this happen. So a few days before we thought we were not the winners and we just felt like a planet was moving in the wrong way in the universe because this must happen. So. It was a few days before, and then we realized that it must happen. Great, and um, <laughs> uh, you deserve it, no doubt. Um, <clears throat> what I'm intrigued by, you are planning to develop the world's largest uh, experimental facility to model the human brain. Yes. Um, you are not modest. Why <laughs> are you taking that position, the world's largest? And I'm yes. aware that it yeah. is commitment to well, you see, what we want to do is build a CERN for the brain because we feel it's critical to trigger a massive, globally collaborative and very focused effort at understanding the brain. We, we need to piece together all the data and the knowledge that has been accumulated over the past 200 years and we need to bring it together, integrate it, so that we can actually move, to, move forward in a unified understanding of the brain. So it's really a CERN for the brain, and it's a strategy of how to bring all of this data together. We've, this project is really based on a lot of uh, precursor work, not just from our lab, but from many labs across Europe. And um, we've built it up to this point where we can see the roadmap. We have a 600-page document now that describes how we're going to do this. We're very keen to get going and, and starting. How long will it take to translate your results in daily practice, so to say? Mm -hmm. For it could be a big help for people who are suffering from Parkinson or are, su are suffering from Alzheimer. So with an aging population yeah. in Europe, we are so interested in the yeah. results. Yeah. When? Is it there? So um, we, we anticipate that over the course of the next 10 years, we will have a facility that can digest the data, put it together and construct models as accurately as we can describe it biology, in, uh, biologically. But we can also, through simulations, fill a lot of gaps. We've, we've actually found that it is impossible to experimentally map every part of the brain. We have to use supercomputing simulations to complete that process. So we anticipate that we should get to a very advanced level of allowing the world to come together around the table, go towards a unifying model, and integrate our knowledge of how the brain works to make a big difference within these 10 years. Um, in, in medicine, there are two very uh, straightforward, in some sense, straightforward impacts that we believe that can uh, benefit society quite early. On the one level, we actually think that there are many drugs that have failed today in clinical testing, um, but not because they're bad drugs, it's because we haven't been able to match them to the patient. So if we can just get a better matching to the patient, we may discover that there are lots of solutions today. To do that, we really need to look at all the data that's out there on brain diseases, not just one, not just Alzheimer's, but all of them, and compare them and see how they fit together and get signatures of diseases. And then we can find better ways to create groups of patients match them to drugs, and you say this drug will help this patient with this type of Alzheimer's and not that patient. So there's a huge opportunity for us to do that. And then these signatures we use as configurations to help us build brain models of diseases. 
that we can then explore what's the best way to treat that brain disease and how we can develop drugs that should hit certain targets. Very often it may not be necessary to hit the, the obvious target. The brain is very complicated, there's all kinds of interactions, and we may have to hit a non-obvious target. And it's really only through simulations that we're going to be able to explore all those possibilities. When will this be available? Anyhow in a phase that it could already make sense? I'm thinking of myself. <laughs> well, um, we aim within the first 18 months to have a facility available for the communities to begin putting their knowledge together. We have to accelerate this process. We have to bring the people together. We have to pool our knowledge. We have to integrate all this information. And w our, our goal is to have a human brain simulation within these 10 years. And you are also multi-thinking of other areas that are close connected in the next generation robots. You yes. are also connecting. Could you tell a bit more? Well, we have an enormous opportunity in uh, the brain as an ICT system. It is a fantastic computer. It uses uh, a banana a day to sustain it, as opposed to gigawatts. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's quite reliable, given that many things can go wrong, and it still keeps functioning. We lose lots of neurons a day, and we still keep functioning. We get wiser. Um, uh, it, it doesn't need to be programmed. And so we're facing, in computer science, we're facing a, a wall uh, with digital computers. Energy, they demand more energy. As they go faster, they make more mistakes. Uh, it's becoming more complex to program them. And brain-like computers, they use much lower energy, they're much more reliable, and they don't require programming because they learn. So. We have a pipeline and a method where we're going to take these very detailed simulations running on supercomputers, make them simpler, and put them on silicon. And this is what we call neuromorphic computing systems. It's not about copying the brain on hardware. It is about using the brain's capabilities in hardware. It's about implementing certain features in hardware. So we can imagine in the future and actually quite soon in the future, uh, computing, uh, computer processes that are working like pieces of the brain, features of the brain, decision making, uh, complex data analysis, very good guessing uh, about what, what is the outcome of an event that may be very complex to analyze on a digital machine. So what we imagine is the future desktop will have a normal digital processor and a neuromorphic computing processor. And that would give you human-like or brain-like computing capabilities. The, the two questions. Number one, is a part of your team at that time, so thinking of the future, is it that robot-connected type of um, thinkers? Yes. And the other one is, how many females are involved in your whole research activity? Um, is it um, a, a high number? So, um, it, in, in all these areas, uh, we have to work hard at gender balance. But we, ha we have between 20 and 30 percent um, female participation in the project. So, uh, and we have a roadmap where we're going to bring that up aggressively. So we, we're very confident that we're going to be able to achieve a very good uh, gender balance during this, um, the period of this project. The robotic part is very important for us because essentially the brain processes information, sends information, but it has to be translated into a behavior, into cognition, into intelligent functions. And so by creating a closed loop, we should be able to, between the model and the robot, we should be able to allow robots to use a brain the way we use a brain and learn how to do something interesting. So it's not so much about programming a robot to do something interesting, it's about giving it a, a, a brain, a little brain, a, an artificial brain. Of course, much simpler, but it would execute certain tasks very efficiently. What is your dream? We want to understand how the brain represents reality. This is the most magical, it's really fundamental science. Uh, we, there's all kinds of electrical activity, chemical processes. Uh, 
But it all translates into this world. And we all build our own reality to some extent. We have a lot of subjective influences. And ultimately, as scientists, our fundamental question is to understand how the brain builds, represents reality, and allows us to maneuver in that reality. And all for a global, better world, so to say. You know, yeah. uh, Shimon Peres put it very nicely. Yeah. We are strangers to ourselves mm. because we do not understand our brain. We mm. do not understand that we are on a wild horse that is just running around commanding us. Deeper knowledge of the brain, I believe, just on a fundamental level, will have a profound impact on society. I'm looking forward to your results and I'm really grateful for your answers. Thank you very Thanks. much.